Now we have, uh, last but not least, Kyle Resch of Tom Resch & Sons Orchards. He is a third generation apple grower in Michigan. His grandfather started the farm over 60 years ago, and today they grow 130 acres of apples. Kyle's vision is to one day have the whole farm become regenerative organic certified, a goal he pursues alongside advancing eco agriculture. Uh, together, Kyle and AEA implement data-driven programs and regenerative practices that help Kyle reach new levels of nutrient density and crop performance. Please welcome Kyle. Well, I'm honored to be part of this inspiring group of speakers. If you see me looking down, I'm just checking my notes real quick. So I've been one of those curious audience members for the past uh, five years or so. And yeah, much of what we've accomplished on our farm was only possible because of all of these great speakers and everything they've had to share. So I'm grateful to be part of this. And uh, yeah, let's begin. I just like to say this is our regenerative journey. We're, we're just at the beginning stages of this. So <clears throat> all of this is only possible because of a very patient and uh, inspiring team that we're a part of. So up in the left corner, you can see our my immediate family. And we've got an excellent group of full-time employees as well as a... Uh, about 20 people that come in, 20 adults with their families that come in seasonally as well to help. And this is just a quick video here to give a little inkling of what we're doing. It's a bit of a satire, so don't pay too much attention to the details, but more to get a visual representation. Hi, I'm Kyle Rash. I am a third generation apple grower just northeast of Grand Rapids. And some might say we do things a bit unconventionally here. But really, we're just doing things the same way it was done before synthetic chemicals became available. And with a little twist. Growing organic apples in Michigan isn't just getting to know the trees, soil, and partnering with nature. To make it to harvest, we use proactive practices such as balancing nutrition, using microbes and plant extracts to deter pests and disease, and a whole host of practices from the past and new technologies just being discovered. Our family and team work all year to provide some of the most flavorful Michigan apples. I'm Organic Kyle. Some might say I'm a bit unconventional, and they may be right. Well, I hope you all could hear that. Obviously, it's a bit of a, a comedic take on what people might imagine organic or regenerative farming to look like, and the reality is quite different. Um, this was actually a, a little thing Michigan apples put on TikTok and social media to compare conventional apple growing to organic apple growing in Michigan, which is just starting at the moment. And uh, by chance, there happens to be a conventional apple grower just down the road from me whose name is also Kyle Rash. So to continue, uh, this is just a bit of a look at where apples have been over the past. So about 8,000 years ago or 10,000 years ago, apples were more or less just uh, planted by seed and not really intensively managed. And, and over the years, our ancestors have grown to cultivate them quite meticulously and going through some chemical revolution. And up to 1960s when my grandfather started to to manage the land I'm on now. So he went through some good times, had a lot of innovation during the 1960s, the chemical revolution, and bins per tree. They had massive trees at that time, so everything was a quite a different glimpse than what it is now into agriculture. And it was it was a profitable enterprise at that time to do it conventionally. But there were many challenges as well. He had loss of chemistries um, as well. It was getting complicated every year, more and more complicated. And there was endless replanting to try and stay relevant. And then my dad became involved in the farm. And he had a whole new host of tools, just continuous innovation in chemicals as well as me mechanical um, means of management. And the bins per acre began to increase and the systems began to look quite a lot different having going from 30 to 50 trees per acre up to a thousand and even excess of that now, as well as many new varieties. So 
that led to many of the same challenges my grandfather faced, as well as challenges finding labor. Margins were continually decreasing and new varieties weren't quite what they were cracked up to be. We were also struggling with replant disease and just a constant pressure to get big or to get out of the industry. So essentially I came into a, a situation where I had to embrace change and you can pick any quote here, but essentially in order to be a farmer, you have to be ready and open for change. So I accepted my fate around 2013 and it took about five years to get fully committed to the farm, traveling in the off season and visiting just about every place that grew apples and tried to learn what regenerative or organic apples might look like in a climate similar to ours, as well as working on biodynamic and permaculture and all sorts of farms. And over that time, I started to become clear on why I wanted to farm. And a lot of that had to do with healing. So healing the soil and all that correlates with, as the presenters very well spokenly alluded to, the, the, the potential for regenerative agriculture is massive. And a lot of that is due to the soil, but there's also a lot of healing that needs to be done just in nature in general, in our immediate families and, and as well as community at large. So those are some of the reasons that inspire me. So our orchard is kind of a mix between these two. So we've got kind of the two extremes here, a modern, very high density, six foot by, I believe, one foot in between each liter here. And hoping to get over 200 bins an acre on that system. And on the right, you see a more traditional planting that includes, includes livestock. And that if they get 10 bins an acre is a, a good scenario. So we place ourselves somewhere in, in the middle of that. Um, unlike the presenter from last year, um, Stephen Beerlink, I believe his name was, we are kind of not shooting for 160 bins, but we do definitely include many of the uh, the modern practices as well. And we, we do have over 100 unique blocks on 130 acres and nearly half of the farm is just about certified regenerative organic and the other half is making steps towards that direction. But we have every planting from these high density plantings all the way up to these massive rootstocks, um, maybe a, only 50 trees an acre. So it's it's a bit of a a challenge to manage all those different things. But even though we are a small family farm, we do provide thousands of people with apples and uh, apples are a great source of probiotics. So I, I see it as quite a valuable, valuable uh, thing we add to society. So a big part of the basis for what we do is focusing on ecosystems and recognizing that we're, we're not just this monoculture, but having access to about 30 acres of beneficial habitat, including wildflowers on our property, as well as about 30 acres of cover crop fields that are in preparation, long-term multi-mix cover crop fields that spend about 10 to 15 years re rebuilding that soil intentionally to prepare for uh, our next plantings, as well as a lot of work with including nature. So that includes our permanent beehives we have on the farm, as well as all the predators that help us to keep the, the system in balance. So I could speak on soil, but I think there was a lot more qualified people to dive into that. But essentially we're trying to focus on creating a balance and what that means specifically to us is getting a good balance of fungally dominant soil, um, always minimizing disturbance and and having a, a good mix of, of species to help do that intentionally. So we do a bit of inoculation, but a lot of what we do is just focusing on creating the right environment. And essentially most things you don't really have to introduce in that case. Although in heavily degraded soils, we have used things like opiate to, to kind of kickstart that. But really what we're trying to do is to, to mimic the, the forests of Kazakhstan and try and create a forest soil. 
So you can see in the background here are some wood chips and how thoroughly those are, are uh, inoculated with, with mycorrhiza and other, other, important, other important microbes. So we are on the path from a degenerative system to a regenerative. And what that means is really a big shift in our mindset. Um, it's a completely different set of tools as well. We've got in apples, just for a bit of background, if you were tuned into last year's talk, you may have noticed that apples can be very intensively managed. And that includes a lot of hormone, playing with hormones, PGRs. We've got, I mean, there's a reason it, it can be on the top 10 list of most sprayed, sprayed uh, produce and things to be cautious is because they are highly manipulated. And we're really trying to find a weird balance in conventional agriculture between trying to grow as much production while at the same time shutting the tree down and trying to, uh, to prepare for next year's crop at the same time. So it's, it's a new set of tools with regenerative and it takes a bit of time to get used to that. And regenerative doesn't necessarily mean that it's a low tech answer. It's, it often includes some more technical things as well. And especially when you have to work with more mechanical systems and really getting to, to find new and creative solutions to these. And it does equal low disturbance though. So we're always trying to minim mitigate that disturbance. And our uh, simple formula that we've found that works best for us is that if you take X, sorry, actually there is no formula. I was just kidding there. So essentially the, you have to create your own formula for what works on your land. There's, there's some general principles that may line, but it's, it's really taking each situation uniquely and trying to apply those lessons. And that can look quite different. So each context is a bit unique. We've got here in Michigan, a unique climate. For starters, we've got a very humid climate, so that increases our fungal pressure quite substantially. And all the other things that Michigan has that's beautiful, but frost and, and oh, you name it. We, we pretty much have everything, but we also have a great, great resource of water near us. So I'm not going to diss Michigan, although Washington definitely has it easier on the fungal side. Um, it's also important to recognize your neighbors and what sort of pressure you may have for abandoned orchards or if there's drift coming in from those neighbors. And what market you're selling to. We do a bit of direct and wholesale, but that can greatly change how you how you might intend to grow a block. If you're simply growing for quantity, you may have a completely set different set of uh, important factors. But at the moment, we are primarily growing for quantity or rewarded based on quantity, although quality is a very important consideration for us. But essentially, there's no incentive in apples at the moment to grow a higher quality other than if it leads to a better pack out or something like that. But we're also a majority of our apples are going for process. So at the end of the day, there's no incentive other than in, uh, having it, the certification. And there's not really much recognition for regenerative at the moment. So we're selling just into the commodity organic market. So here's where we start to get a bit of difference from some of the talks today is that we're really looking at a long-term commitment here with apples, and with tree fruit in general, or any perennial. It's, it's a bit of a challenge. There's, imagine, I guess here, imagine a corn crop that you plant and the first year you get one foot of growth. And maybe within four years, you might get your first corn crop. And then just to break even, you might have to wait 10 years. And that's best case scenario if you switch that to apples. We, we hope to break even by 10 years, but oftentimes it could take 20 or 30 years to recoup that, that uh, investment. And that's if the markets haven't changed, if the trees haven't died, if something became... irrelevant up till that too to make mindful steps here. And uh, yeah, we've made plenty of mistakes. And as you can imagine, there's a reason we have a hundred different blocks and it's because we're, we're constantly learning and, and perfecting our, our, our uh, system that works best for us. So 
with this commitment, um, rootstocks and varieties are essential part of that. And I'm not going to dive into that because I'm not sure how relevant that is to everybody, but it's just a an essential part is genetics in this. And you plant the wrong rootstock or plant the wrong variety, it can completely make or break your profitability. And to cut down a block is a very difficult thing to do. I had to do it several times, but it's something that you want to avoid by any means possible. And also just in regards to this, there are many varieties that can set you up for success and each of them has its own unique challenges and can take a lifetime to understand. For example, Honeycrisp, I don't think we've even quite figured out as an industry how to grow them consistently and it's it's been all of 20 years. So, so you can plant as many varieties as you want, but to some extent it's good to learn on a couple and uh, find a balance there, I suppose. We've, we grow about 12 varieties and we're an expert in none, but we, we do them all quite fairly. So. so another big difference here is how we manage our orchard floor. There's quite a large difference between managing a young tree versus an established tree. Um, there are, of course, the options of, of Omri herbicide and flame weeding and, and tillage, but we've, we've avoided those practices on our farm. And it may be something that we're reconsidering at the moment because new plantings are something that we've struggled with. So at the moment, our answer to that is wood chip mulch. And that has been successful, um, but we've also struggled quite a lot with new plantings where we didn't put wood chips down, where not only mice, but also voles will go through and almost eat an entire block of trees throughout one winter. And you'll never know what was happening because the snow is covering it. and they just follow along the, the entire row of trees and, and can eliminate just about every root hair on there. So we've taken, taken a, a pause on new plantings as a, as a business and focused on converting some of our established blocks. A big part of that also is having a healthy between row. So that's having a healthy set of orchard grass or whatever it is you have planted. We often intentionally plant something in the beginning, but that changes throughout the lifespan of the orchard. And we just let that happen naturally and uh, embrace a, what I like to call, or what I'm calling at the moment, a successive chaos. So you may have heard people, John Kemp talks quite well about this, but that essentially every plant is there as an indicator or accomplishing some, some benefit to the soil, moving it towards a forest system, essentially, if that's the, uh, the soil type, of course. So we, we look at underneath the tree growing everything. Initially, we do it, put some uh, oats and rye and a few things just to help inoculate or to get the, the soil kick-started, but then we just let whatever comes up essentially take over. And that can look like thistles and can look very concerning at times. And, and there is some management there, of course. We do mow that before it goes to flower to, to limit that the uh, spreading of that. But there is quite a uh, amount of value that that can bring. So dandelions, for example, bringing up calcium and, and just having a living soil in general, we really focus on. And we also incorporate mow and blow quite a bit. So essentially every time we're mowing, or the middle of the drive row, we're also blowing that grass clippings underneath the tree and continuing to feed that system. And we also use a swing arm mower underneath the tree and a uh, we're looking into getting a, something to help with the, the weeds that are directly aligned with the, the trunk in some of our systems that are a bit challenging to reach with a mower. So what does that look like on our farm? On the left here, you can see how we manage with wood chips occasionally. And this was a system that was converted on the left here. So obviously these weeds are not ideal in the center here, but it was what, what we were, were left with. But oftentimes in the spring, this is a common site here. It's just a massive diversity of plants and, and indicators of what's going on. Um, as well as a lot of violets and, and other species, but that does change through time as well. So on young trees, this is kind of 
what our system is starting to look like. So we have a few young plantings and, and wood chips are really a key aspect of that. Um, it's, it's an expensive practice and to put enough wood chips out is a, it's quite a mind boggling amount of wood chips per acre and a bit cost prohibitive if you can't find an affordable access to that. But it does seem to limit mice damage. And of course, it's a huge benefit to, uh, to the soil health. We've got massive water holding capacity benefits and a crazy amount of, of life going on. Anytime you, you want to find some mycorrhizae, you can just peek under any of those wood chips and it's just a solid stream the whole way down the row. And certain times of the year, you'll actually have an entire, an entire uh, line of mushrooms growing the, the whole length of the tree rows. So that's how we've managed mice in young blocks. And, and in larger trees, it's still a concern for mice, but not nearly the same. But we're really just focusing on creating a living and healthy soil. So you can see some of the plants that initially come up can look a bit, um, yeah, just they can overpower the tree. You can see here a, a planting that was converted and it's overrun with, with a Queen Anne's lace, it looks like there, that's nearly as high as the tree. But as that block begins to, to balance out and those, those plants and uh, weeds, as, as some call them, begin to work themselves out of the soil, or actually we oftentimes will take this as an indicator to adjust the soil at times as well. And if it's, if it's calcium showing up as a deficiency by way of dandelions and applying calcium can, can often move to, to uh, not eliminate the dandelions, but, but move towards the next successive species. So transitioning is a, uh, it's quite a challenge. It, we've had, we've always been told in our area that it's impossible to grow organic. And that was mainly because the first few years people just were overwhelmed with how, how many shifts they had to make in their mindset and oftentimes just stopped after the first year or two. So it's really something that does take time. And I like to think of it like if I were a doctor and suddenly decided to remove all pharmacological, pharmacological intervention from my patients, what do you think would happen? I think it's kind of what we're dealing with in conventional agriculture. These trees are heavily dependent on all these, these synthetic compounds and hormones and trying to find these balances in the tree. And it's it's really quite a an addictive system, and to just overnight switch, it's it can be quite quite concerning to the trees. You can see them suffer immediately, and and we're beginning to make steps now to to bridge that. Either by one starting to have that transition start while it is still a technically conventional block, but beginning to build up that soil health, beginning to remove some of those more addictive compounds such as apogee, which is a, a growth inhibitor, or, or maybe some of the PGRs that, that uh, can just really confuse the tree essentially. And we're also using tools like grafting here to ease into this a little more as well. It's, it's already getting a shock, but by grafting, we can one, set the tree into a more vegetative state because oftentimes those first couple of years, the trees have to completely restart their root system that's been dependent on synthetic nitrogen for so long. And to suddenly have to, to work for their food, it's, it's quite shocking. So this can help that process. Um, maybe you change a variety at this time. You don't have to learn as abruptly about what pests and disease may become an issue, but otherwise these are common sites here in, in as you transition. And, being open and, and prepared for these changes has made it a lot easier for us. So this may look familiar to a few of you, um, something we're definitely embracing for the past, as, as soon as John Kempf put this out, we were very excited. And initially I was really struggling to figure out how to make organic work in Michigan. And of course this came up just about at that time and gave me a whole new lens into how how organic could be possible here because to take a conventional organic approach as they do in Washington and just simply replace your your 
conventional chemistries with organic chemistries that are slightly less effective is it's a very difficult thing to do in, in apples anyway, especially in Michigan. We have very high pressure. So one of the challenges, so we, we utilize this pyramid very regularly in, in all of our, our considerations. And also apples are tasty. And that adds a bit of a, a complication to the mix because as healthy, as healthy as our tree is, it doesn't really matter as long as our apples are not able to defend themselves. So of course, the very, very peak of the pyramid, the plant health pyramid is your fruit. And that's often a bit of a challenge to get that resistance built up in fruit initially and early on in the season. As the season progresses, those secondary plant metabolites and sugars are accumulating and, and that, that fruit does become quite more resistant. But really, we have to look at what are the root causes beyond the symptoms. And, and that's been our, our means of getting through a lot of things. So this is a, a woolly apple aphid infestation. And each of these little things inside of here are aphids that are exuding this waxy substance. And aphids in general are pretty well understood and it was a bit of a challenge getting my my father to to uh, open up to the idea that there could be a a root cause to aphids that you don't have to actually spray for everything out there. So this is just an example where we looked into the nutritional situation in the tree, noticed that nitrogen was a bit high, and noticed across the board that seemed to correlate. And as we began to, to limit our nitrogen use and, and find a more balanced approach to that, as well as having the patience to, to wait for those beneficials to show up, the beneficial predators to show up, um, that it's really a key part of how we've made this work is, is letting patients prevail in some of these situations, but also knowing when you have to act. So nutrition is the base of our program, and we do a lot of testing. There's far greater experts on that, but we, we do SAP testing, we do a bit of everything, and it's an important part of how we, we are able to, to get a system that's really jump-started and, and helping to defend itself. So we start with the soil and work up to foliar feeding the tree, and through this process, we're trying to find a hormonal balance within the tree, as just because you have a healthy tree doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to produce healthy fruit nor does it mean that you're going to have a healthy crop next year because we're producing our fruit buds for next year as we're growing the crop for this year. So we have to be very cautious not to get any excesses and use nutrition to ensure that we're encouraging hormones that will elicit bud growth for that following year. And just a bit of a, a note here, we we do have the challenge of food safety in apples, so we we do struggle with a lot of these these produce with the fresh produce to uh, find systems that really work the best way they could because we can't include livestock. We can't. We have to be really cautious of what we apply throughout the season, and uh, well, we do have livestock, um, but it's below the ground here. And we could go to some extremes to uh, as well to. To help with fruit safety but that's also not something we're open to doing it's we've played around with netting but this is this is not the orchard we're trying to design and just a little note as well that apples are very sensitive so as you're making your different concoctions that you're blending up with all of these tools i'm about to mention be very cautious about what you're mixing in the tank because apples are notorious for showing up everything that happened throughout the season, whether that be frosts or, or something physical or chemical, which is what we see here is this was a tank mix that as I was learning about organic and making some of my first experiments, I learned very quickly to be cautious of what's going in the tank. So what does our foliar program look like? First off, we've got to focus on water quality. Um, you can't focus on that enough. I mean, we've got really high bicarbonates and if you don't prioritize that, I'm sure you've heard it before, but it's it's going to negate everything else you do from there. So, which is also just a, a side note, it's very important to consider while you're irrigating as well what your bicarbonates are and how that's impacting. 
Um, our next step is working with inoculation. And this is all after we consider nutrition, of course. Uh, so inoculating with something like a micro 5000 or or some sort of a a uh, a plant out competing plant microbe essentially then we work with some some systemic acquired resistance and and induce systemic resistance products work up to deterrence whether that be plant botanicals or maybe something mineral based like a diatomaceous earth and up to disruption, which in our situation would be mating disruption, or maybe that is, uh, there's other forms there, and as well working with insect-specific viruses and introducing predators. So we rely heavily on models, and these are just different disease models and insect models. And you could use a calendar, but really that's not adequate anymore. These calendars are not always accurate about when a pest or disease might be showing up. So we're using a lot of, lot of in-field monitoring and just being out in the orchard observing. I can't stress that enough. We, I learned that from my dad very early on is that one of the best ways to figure out what's going on in orchard in, an, in a block is to just go out there and, and sit in the block and just essentially start a dialogue with the trees. And so I've, I've continued that on myself as well. So some of the things we, we, of course, work on ecologically is having a lot of beneficials, beneficial habitat and attracting the, the pests that we do want, as well as working at deterring those that we don't with our ecosystem. And then with fungus specifically, it's really critical to have an open canopy or an open tree. We don't want to have all these spaces where higher humidity can form. And at the bottom here, you can see as well, spray coverage is essential. If we're not reaching these, these nutrients and these deterrents where they need to be, then it's all for naught. Um, again, models, there's a lot of tools as well that we use mechanical means. And what do the results look like? So this is this past year's crop. This is a, it's third year into transition, a block of galas on 106. Um, I'll just scroll through a few pictures so you can visually see some of the blocks. That's what the fruit looked like off of that. This is a block of goldens that a lot of these my dad planted and it was the highest production we believe it's ever seen. So it's pretty exciting to, to see that five years into the regenerative program. That's what the fruit looked like. This was a another result. We had one of the best crops on this block of empire specifically, but we also found our maximum here because we, we were unable to feed this one well enough and found that we don't have any buds this year. So there are certain varieties that are, are uh, challenging in that respect. So our results, um, years one through three, uh, roughly a one to three year drop in yield is what we've been seeing, but we're, we've been learning ways to get through that a little more uh, feasibly. Also by year three, we're starting to see either the same yield as conventional or increases in yield. Flavor might be a bit biased, but everyone we, uh, we work with is always mentioning how flavorful our fruit is and the nutrition quality is obviously something that is correlating with that. And just seeing the ecosystem and the, the, the natural uh, system start to really get kickstarted. So between what's happening in the soil as well, what's happening in the trees now, after three years, you really start to get some of these, these systems that start to take care of a lot of the problems on its own. And uh, profitability, of course, a big focus. We couldn't be doing any of this if it wasn't profitable. And at the moment, it is profitable, but there's room to grow as well. And we are inspiring neighbors along the way. So I'm excited to see where this is headed. We've got, I believe one of my neighbors is tuning into this right now that I've been mentoring. So, ah, some opportunities. Collaboration is essential here. I can't mention how many people have helped along this journey and how many essential steps and just learning curves we've had that we wouldn't have to do all on our own. So it's, it's really important to have those local as well as collaborators globally as well that you can learn, learn with. Um, 
there's a turnover and extension right now in university extensions. I think there is an opportunity to get a new group of experts and maybe start cycling out some of that old paradigms and begin to open up to more regenerative practices. And I think regenerative organic offers its own opportunity. I think packers and processors have to be a major part of this as well. I think that's one of our biggest challenges at the moment is the people we're selling to don't have an idea what regenerative is and don't value it. So we are selling into the conventional organic sphere at the moment and really would push for any way to collaborate with a group. So we're beginning to start those conversations, but it's still years off. So storytelling, any way you can tell that story, whether it's through a certification or through videos or social media, that's an essential part of keeping this momentum. And I would say innovation is ripe at the moment. There's endless innovation, both in the, uh, the products as well as the tools. So chemical experimenters like my father, I believe can benefit greatly from these practices. And we have benefit greatly. He's, he was a bit resistant to some of the change that was happening, but this whole time he's also been one of my biggest supporters. And every year he's more and more encouraged. So I'm really grateful for that relationship, but also just seeing what he's opened up to on the conventional side. And I mean, if we could sell every, every apple regenerative right now, we, we would do it immediately. If we could do it, if we could do it, um, profitably. But I think at the moment, we're still finding those markets and, and taking the steps to get there. And the ways he's benefited, though, unconventional is that we've, we've stopped using herbicide on a majority of our conventional acres now, only in the spots that are uh, under micro sprinklers, essentially. And also softened up his program a lot and rethought the importance of soil health. So all these things can really benefit most any grower. I think it's just finding the ways to, to open up those growers' minds. And my father took three, four years to really get there, but now he's one of my biggest proponents. So I think just having that patience and, and not forcing it. And also, I'd just like to, to take this moment to, to forget or to make sure as us as growers don't forget to, to take a, a moment to look inward and in what we want out of this experience. And as well as how we're, we're treating our employees. We can't, we can't sacrifice ourselves to reach a regenerative future. And essentially it would be in the ideal scenario, we should be regenerating ourselves along the way, both financially and healing. So I, I take that as a big responsibility to, to our team here. So to recap, we have a very long commitment with trees and Everyone, including mice, voles, insects, fungus, all love apples. So be prepared for that and get ready to write your own formula. The toolkit is expanding and I'm excited to see where it's going. I think we're doing a lot of experimentation on our farm and finding those ways of collaborating with other people to, to not have to recreate that toolkit on each farm is, is amazing. And food safety, I think, in an ideal world, I'd be doing everything I was told by our, our consultants, but unfortunately we have to be very cautious to, to find that balance between finding the most regenerative system and, and uh, nutritious system, but as well, our food safety side, we have to be cautious that we're not throwing any red flags with putting anything that could be causing a uh, concern really to our auditors. And in reality, there's, there's not a whole whole lot of me that's excited about eliminating birds from the orchard, for example, but that's where they'd like to go. So the opportunities is uh, just that journey towards resilience. I think it's really exciting to know that we could be creating a system that could eventually be a system that is sustainable and uh, not only sustainable, regenerative, of course, but that's something that can be passed on for not only generations, but could be the beginning steps of what could be the, the future of agriculture for thousands of years, who knows. And subsidies, I think they do play a big part. Unfortunately, it's crop insurance and all these things are really critical to us as farmers. And without that help, it makes these steps a bit 
challenging, but it seems to be that in this next farm bill, there's a great dialogue with regeneration. So I'm excited to see where that goes. And just another reiteration that I really think it's important to be telling this story. And that can look like some of the inspiring documentaries you see out there, the, the conversations we're having at farmers markets, the, uh, yeah, meetings like this, really. I mean, it's it's a grassroots movement like organic was, but we're, we're getting to redefine what it means to have quality food. So I just leave you with this question of when do you begin to raise a child? A question that I was, that I heard really well stated in a book. And yeah, it's in that book, they mentioned a hundred years, but I, I would say that it could be, could be longer really we're we're creating that that foundation right now for what our generations hundreds if not thousands of years from now will be inheriting so i think it's really important to, to ask that question and to, to see what that means to you and and to constantly be on that path of how to find a new iteration a new a new system that can that can be brought into the future so with that if anyone has any questions um, again, yeah, my name is Kyle Rash. The name of our farm that we go to market with is Third Leaf Farm, and Tom Rash and Son Orchards is our parent company. But happy to answer any questions, and if anyone needs any regenerative apples, feel free to reach out. <laughs> Wonderful. Kyle, what a great story. Uh, we do have some questions here, so I want to go through a couple of them quickly, and then we'll bring everybody back on board, and we'll probably cover some more of your questions then. Uh, so thank you again. First question from our audience. Did you see an increase in pests with newer hybrid varieties, or did you happen to notice that native varieties can handle or adapt better to pest challenges? I suppose they're talking in regards to apples, so I would say that technically there really aren't many there aren't any native apples, the Malus domestica species anyway, but but in regards to maybe more conventionally used varieties or, or more, more heritage varieties, if you will, that have been around for a longer time, a lot of those varieties did have qualities that kept them around because they were pest and disease resistance, mm -hmm. resistant. And some of the newer varieties are simply bred because they're a good package um, or a good, they have a quality, but maybe they don't have I mean, a lot of them, yeah, really struggle with pests and disease. So take, for example, scab resistant varieties. That is a, a new thing that's coming up and a thing that used to be around, but really a lot of the, uh, the modern varieties don't consider that in the US. So in other countries, like in Europe, throughout Europe, there's a huge push for these scab resistant varieties as well, considering rootstocks. That's a huge, huge thing to consider, definitely. Thank you. Uh how did you manage fungal fruit rot issues with high humidity and the want or desire to reduce fungicide applications? Yeah, that's a great question. So like I mentioned, it's kind of a working through that plant health pyramid. So we're, we're beginning with nutrition and really trying to focus on getting that balanced nutrition. Um, working with good varieties. I mean, some varieties are just always going to have issues with fungus. Unfortunately, if you if you plant a, a Macintosh, it's like a, a perfect Petri dish for, for just about every fungus. So, But some of the other things we do is definitely timely. So we, we are still using a bit of sulfur, but it's very low rates of sulfur and it's very timely. So we're using not even a third of the recommended rate and just doing it right during an infection. So maybe a anywhere from two to five pounds instead of 15 and higher rates, 15 pounds in excess conventionally in a conventional organic. So that's a big thing as well as many, like I mentioned, ISRs, um, SARs, there's a lot of small things you can do, but I'd say the biggest things are, are uh, really trying to create that inoculated surface, that, that balanced system that's going to defend as best it can against things. And then, and these really high risk infections, doing a bit of excess things if you don't have that confidence. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, okay, uh, what are the key nutrients or fertilizers you use to protect the apples against insects? Ooh, that is a big question. Let's <laughs> see. <laughs> well, I'm, we use a lot of AEA products for our foliar nutrition program. And the question was, which nutrition products or what was the- Key nutrients or fertilizers. Yeah. Yes, and 
in regards to nutrients, um, it's really about not necessarily one nutrient. I would say it's about finding that balanced package and, and looking at your SAP test and finding what do you have excesses and, and uh, what are your minimums and how do you how do you get those ideal ratios? And of course, we do also rely a lot on some of our fish early on in the season and that, that chitin can kind of act as a um, as an inducer of resistance for insects as well. So that can help. Um, but otherwise, it's just balanced nutrition, really.